not. Last week was Communion Sunday. <laughs> and oftentimes when I'm assigned to the roving communion station, my most enjoyable time is serving communion to our two to four-year-olds. They see me and shout, I want big Jesus. And then sometimes they even request in a whisper, I want little Jesus. Sometimes they even request more dip, please. I once overheard a preschool Sunday school class talking about Jesus. The Sunday school teacher of these preschoolers asked the students to learn one fact about Jesus to bring back to Sunday school the following Sunday. The following week, she asked each child in turn what he or she had learned. Susie said, Mommy said Jesus was born in a manger. And Bobby said, Jesus threw the money changers out of the temple. And then little Johnny said, he has a red pickup truck and he doesn't know how to drive it. <laughs> Curious, the teacher asked, and where did you learn that, Johnny? From my daddy, said Johnny. And the teacher asked, so he said, well, tell us a little bit more. And Johnny says, well, yesterday we were driving down the highway and this red pickup truck pulled out of, in front of us and Daddy yelled at him, Jesus Christ, where did you learn how to drive? <laughs> yes, yes, I know. Lent is a time of reflection. But it doesn't mean that it all has to be sober and somber. It's okay to laugh a little. This morning, as we do reflect on the text of Jesus flipping out and overturning the tables of the money changers, let us take some time to remember what the message Jesus Christ brings us. What Jesus brings us is saying that when, he, when Jesus uncharacteristically reacts to how we have treated God's temple, and I'm not certain exactly to what extent of going ballistic Jesus accomplishes, but I think we get the point. Let us think on these things. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts, may they be acceptable in thy sight, our God, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. There's a part of me, and I'm sure a part of many of us, that likes calm, you like to know what to expect. To be able to create order and a system that creates the least amount of chaos as possible. Yet, there's a part of me that's open to the spirit, being flexible, able to go with the flow. Think about a sports game. Most of the excitement is what keeps sports fans watching, and if we always knew what would happen next, life well, it might kind of be boring. Well, today, we definitely get something exciting. Today, Jesus is doing something unexpected. Today, we get a view of the radical Jesus. The Jesus that we often hear of. Jesus who comes to rock our world. Today, we hear from the Gospel text of John, chapter 2, verses 13 to 22, that Jesus a guy who never is boring, flips out unexpectedly in order to change the world, an order that folks are getting complacent in. As you remember, when the Passover feast celebrated each spring by the Jews was about to take place, Jesus traveled up to Jerusalem. He found the temple, teeming with people, selling cattle and sheep and cows and doves. Like the kids, they didn't do a dove, they did a chicken. But the loan sharks were also there in full strength. And so Jesus put together a whip out of strips of leather and chased them out of the temple, stampeding the sheep and the cattle and upending the tables of the loan sharks and money changers, spilling coins left and right. And he told the dove merchants, get your things out of here. Stop turning my house, my father's house, into a shopping mall. That's when his disciples remembered the scripture, zeal for your house consumes me. For those of you who have been following the marked passages these past few weeks of Lent, 
our lectionary jumps to the Gospel of John. In John, the story of Jesus flipping out and overturning the money changers in the begin, are at the beginning of his ministry, which is why when Jesus was barely even baptized, he already started to shake things up. Why the story of the cleansing of the temple actually comes in all four gospel accounts, in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke. And the biggest difference in John that the money changers and the Pharisees are not accused of being a den of robbers, as in all three of the other gospels. But instead, an angry Jesus flips and says, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. He says this not because he's accusing them of stealing people's money, not because, but because he was observing that how the money changing and sacrifice selling was making money off of worship of God and that they were defiling this marketplace. He was not calling these people den of robbers or corrupt, but telling them that they were in the wrong place if they wanted to worship God. They were still worshiping the material, but Jesus was offering a new message that God cannot be contained. That Jesus was saying to his people, I am the new temple. And if Jesus is the new temple, as the body of Christ, we are called to be the new temple, wherever we are at. During the first Sunday of Lent, I preached about Lent being a time to refocus and reconnect with God, that sin is separation from God. I'd like to focus this week on the Greek word kenosis, the emptying ourselves and letting go to God. Kenosis invites us to release our fears, to no longer be caught up in our anxieties or our self-desires, but to begin a transformation into becoming a channel that Jesus brings about in each of us for God. Jesus challenges us in our material sacrifices to let it stop and let us release and let the change begin in Christ. Oh yes, I would say that Jesus' message was being very bold. He's flipping out. It was a way to a reaction to Jesus' calling the people to accountability. He invited them to a new way of doing church and worshiping God and leaving some ways that were separating people from God. And he introduced them to new ways that could help them reconnect. Yet people still doubted him and continued to challenge him. They doubted his ability and asked, what credentials can you present to justify this? And Jesus answered them, tear down the temple and in three days, I'll put it back together. And so here we are in 2012. Has much changed? We still have our skeptics. Our culture calls us into questioning everything and everyone, from motives to reasons, which is why change must happen. It doesn't always have to be this way. As Jesus calls us into change, we must find ways that we can do so with a renewed sense of strength and empowerment to make change happen. I'm going to ask a pop culture question today. How many of you have heard of Coney 2012? I received a text message on Wednesday afternoon from an eighth grader from Rio Miyazaka who, who asked me on text, do you know what Coney 2012 is? I think we should get involved. So I texted him back, I don't know what it is. Can you tell me? Embarrassing, I, embarrassingly, I had no idea yet. And immediately I jumped online. When I looked at my Facebook, I had already been invited to all of these join Coney 2012 activities and events. And 11th grader Iris Sharp had already invited me to Coney 2012 on April 20th. Was this a party? I didn't know what it was for. So I continued to do my homework. 
And for those of you who do not know what Kone 2012 is, it's the campaign that went viral this week. This morning there were 64 million plus hits. I kept checking throughout the week. It went so quickly out in the media network. And this, is, this went viral in making famous or infamous Joseph Kony, the militant Lord's Resistance Army leader in Uganda who had been kidnapping children since 1987 and making them child soldiers and sex slaves. Information and a cry to all people to make his name be known so that he can be tried by the International Criminal Court for his human rights violations and injustices. What really amazed me was how quickly the news went viral, how quickly a cry for change was happening. This was a new way of doing things. Today's technology is calling us to free us from complacency, to let kenosis happen as we free ourselves to speak what is right, to make change happen. It is exciting to see high school and college students woken up to a difficult situation around the world, to have an awareness, to put down the video games and the cell phone texting, and, to talk, and use it as a media surface to get the news out to other people. Their political senses were aroused to the injustices and violations of international brothers and sisters. How amazing that compassion is to be awakened in people. Whereas people have been turn, tuning out to text their friends or their pastor, that groups of people are willing to spend time and give of themselves and their resources. And there is a new awakening in people. I'd like to see that energy and enlightenment take place in the church as well. Today, we expect instantaneous, fast, accessible, tangible, and it's not only our youth and young adults that want it. We all want it. Remember what Jesus said? Destroy the temple, and in three days, I will raise it again. Yet the people at the temple where Jesus overturned their tables were indignant. It took 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to rebuild it in three days? We are preparing for a new pastor to come very soon. Perhaps not in the metaphorical three days. Nor will this new pastor rebuild the church in three days. We already have a way of life here at FUMC Pasadena that has been filled with tradition and rich culture that has kept this community going. Jesus is not saying that we're doing it wrong. In fact, the life and the mission of the church is the new and renewed Church of Christ. But what Jesus is saying is that as we prepare for a new pastor, we are also called to a time of preparation for transition and change, an opportunity for us to build back up and be renewed in the life of the church. I believe that we should expect our tables to be overturned. This is a very hev heavy table to overturn, but expect that. And expect it to be flipped over for the better. And for the better, I mean I ask you to be open to be open to being renewed and freed from old ways of doing things. That in our time of preparation, we are called to see in new ways. A call to being, a call to be in ministry, a call for us to open our eyes and see what it really, truly means to live the gospel in the world today. And I know that asking you to be open to the spirit of change might be a little scary. But let me share with you a group that really embodied the openness of what change really can be. Last Friday, Reverend Debbie Gare and I were invited to a tea party by the Aldersgate Fellowship Group, one of our oldest fellowship groups in the church, next to the Lamplighters. Aldersgate is a fellowship that has been together for over 70 years. 
Even pre-marriage and children, they have been friends for a lifetime. Once a group of over 100 people, our group of elders is our living legacy at FUMC. In preparing for this Aldersgate meeting, I started to enter with a little trepidation and a heavy heart knowing that it has become more difficult for our Aldersgate leaders, Betty Osborne, Mary Jane Bell, and Ed Sales, to continue leading and planning these monthly meetings, as they have for all these years. I had been asked to give the Alders group, Aldersgate group an opportunity to share what it meant to be a part of the Aldersgate group, and to put some closure on the program in its current form, but instead of mourning, I left with a happy heart as members of the group shared fun stories and adventures as a group. And with an affirmation that yes, change is a coming, but they were open and willing to hear new ways of having different fellowship groups and members of the church community sponsor their Aldersgate activities and events to regenerate and revive Aldersgate in a new way. And in this regeneration, this is a call to all of you, to our church family, for our people to help out and continue the life of Aldersgate and support all of the members of this church. This is our call to change. Kenosis is freedom to not be stuck in routine, to rid our ways that are not life-giving, and to find ways to bring back what it means to be, the, to be Christ church. As one last practice this morning, I'm going to ask you to participate in a Zen-like Buddhist practice that I learned. Yes, we are still United Methodists, and I'm not going to get into the questioning of religion today although this text certainly lends itself to talking about religion. But instead, I'm going to ask you to practice a spiritual discipline with me. I'm going to ask you to be the communal body of Christ. I'm going to ask you to be the church that God asks you to be. So now I invite you to relax, to release your fears, your anxieties, and desires to be God. And I'm going to ask you to be one body of Christ together. I invite you to take a deep breath and let out that exhale. Don't worry about the person next to you. I invite you to take another deep breath, but as you exhale, let out that exhale as loud as you want. Breathe in. Now exhale. Breathe in again. Let it all out. I invite you communally to raise your hands. I invite you to stand if you are able. I invite you to say, praise God. Praise God. I invite you to release and let go and be open to change. I invite you to say amen. 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 Have, a, have a seat.